My name is Kim Peretti. I'm a partner with the law firm of Alston and Bird. Thank you for joining us today for 60 minutes. We have here to talk about cybersecurity. We're going to be covering IT governance, the SEC's re recent risk alerts, um, specific topics in information security that we believe you are probably pondering and have questions about and are more challenging uh, to address in information security, as well as practical advice on, you know, cost-effective strategies to prioritize uh, areas in information security. So happy to be here with you uh, for the next hour. I'm going to start with some brief introductions. Again, I'm Kim Peretti, been an information security professional and lawyer for 20 years. Uh, most of my career was at the Department of Justice, prosecuting hackers in the computer crime and intellectual property section. Um, after eight years of that, I moved over to PwC to lead their cyber forensic unit and really help companies respond to significant security state-sponsored attacks and really learn the tactics of the criminals. Before I moved back into a legal role, when we started to see lawyers get more and more involved in this area and help companies advise, advise companies on cybersecurity preparedness um, and response, as well as um, in the thick of it, responding to significant incidents. So I'm going to turn it to my right to our esteemed panelist, Ms. Alexis Hall from OC. Hi, my name is Alexis Hall, and I'm Senior Regulatory Counsel and Acting Associate Director of OC's Technology Controls Program. I'm just going to take a moment to get our standard disclaimer out of the way. Um, the views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Commission, the Chairman, other Commissioners, or my colleagues on the Commission staff. Okay, and EJ. Hi, my name is EJ Yurzak. I'm a Director of Cyber uh, IT Services uh, for Compliance Solution Strategies. Uh, we, we do compliance consulting and cybersecurity consulting engagements. Uh, firms. Um, my background has been in uh, IT and cybersecurity uh, for a number of years. Um, pretty much uh, had my hand in everything from software development to uh, testing to actually um, you know, consulting on the development of cybersecurity programs. Hey, Ryan. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Ryan Spellman. I'm with uh, CyberClarity360, a solution from Duff and Phelps. Uh, we are a third party cyber risk assessment software platform. Uh, and we've been involved many times in understand, helping people understand what the risk posture is of their outside vendors. Uh, prior to coming on board for the solution, I was with the Center for Internet Security, a best practice uh, and standard setting body in cybersecurity. And prior to that, I was part of the New York State uh, Homeland Security apparatus and different business units, including uh, the really cool sounding Weapons of Mass Destruction Task Force, where <laughs> I handled grant management. Um, <laughs> so, excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a couple preliminary matters. I wanted to remind everyone to feel free to ask questions throughout the throughout our panel discussion today. We'd prefer that rather than have questions at the end. If there's something that piques your interest or you'd like more information on, please feel free to raise your hand and we can we can talk through it then. Um, and also, your materials have a very lengthy outline that goes through um, the current legal uh, landscape in this area, walks through what reasonable security is, some of the laws that apply, and in more detail about the years of uh, risk alerts and observations um, from OC in particular. So we encourage you to, we won't be able to cover all of that today, but we encourage you to, to refer to that for more detailed information. So to kick this off, um, we're going to start with SEC expectations. So just a quick overview before I turn it over to Alexis. Um, since we're only in early March and we had, of course, we had the yearly 2020 national exam priorities come out, which stated that OC has prioritized information security in each of the five examination programs in 2019, so much more information to draw from. Um, and those priorities led and, and are reflected in the statement on observations of cybersecurity and, uh, and operational resiliency, which also came out in January. And that document I encourage everyone to pull up. It is summarized in the outline, but it's much more extensive than we've seen um, in other types of risk alerts and observations and, and goes through effective practices. Um, and in and, and most regulators, including OC, we see, see these become more and more detailed. 
um, over time. So I encourage you to look at it, but at a high level, it has about seven categories that it covers, um, many of which we'll touch upon today. It has governance and risk management, recognizing the importance of executive and board level engagement in cybersecurity, defining your risk methodology, uh, risk assessment methodologies to include cyber threat modeling and being very dynamic and nimble to the current threat landscape, including frequent monitoring and testing. Um, second category is access controls, covering separation of duties, and importantly, the topic which we'll cover later today, multi-factor authentication. When do you need it? How, what's the best strategy and how to implement it? Uh, the third category is a catch-all for many, many different topics in information security, data loss prevention, or DLP, uh, which in includes in the OC observations, vulnerability scanning, perimeter security, detective security, patch management, inventory, uh, management and encryption. One uh, sentence caught my eye and has gotten some coverage from that category, and it's the secure disposal. It's really emphasis on end-of-life cycle development for all of the hardware and software assets that we have. I think a report came out last year that 40% um, from this one company's uh, review, 40% of devices, secondhand devices they reviewed had PII stored on them. So it's often an area that we'll get, you know, we forget about at the end of the day, but what happens at the end of the day when we decommission devices and what do we do with the PII and how do we ensure across the board that there's uh, not an, a risk with respect to information being leaked after we have um, disposed of it. Next category, mobile security. Um, effectively, uh, effective use of mobile device management was emphasized, as, as well as requiring the use of MFA for all internal and external users. Next category was incident response and resilience, resiliency, emphasizing business continuity and resiliency and information security plans. Of course, as we see more and more ransomware and other types of at attacks that do have that operational impact, that part becomes more and more critical. Vendor management, uh, emphasizing due diligence and monitoring um, of vendor relationships to include cloud service vendors. And that, of course, was the risk alert we had in May 2009, looking at effective storage or, or risk of storage with third party providers, including uh, cloud service providers. The one area I thought was interesting in, in that section was that the observations highlighted procedures to govern the termination and replacement of vendors, um, including cloud service providers. So how often are we thinking about if we have a cloud service provider, whether when and whether we decide not to use them, what happens with our data and how do we get it back or whether they um, ultimately go out of business, what are the strategies and procedures in place to get back our data. Um, last two quick categories, training and awareness, which we're going to cover separately on one slide, and threat intelligence, maintaining an ability to get access to real-time indicators of compromises from various sources, including the SEC Cybersecurity Spotlight page, as well as ISACs and other law enforcement advisories that are pushed out. So with that introduction, let me turn it over to Alexis for her thoughts on SEC expectations. Sure, and uh, you know, I can start talking about the 2020 national exam priorities. There's not a lot extra to say here. You know, we publish our priorities annually just to provide an overview of key areas on which we'll focus our examination. And as Kim mentioned, this year we're continuing to prioritize cybersecurity in all five of our program areas. Um, but with respect to investment advisors in, in particular, we're focusing on governance and risk management, access controls, data loss prevention, vendor management, training, incident response, and resiliency. So those are you know, some of the areas that you might expect to come up on examination through either a thematic initiative or, or otherwise, or a, a regular risk-based exam. Um, do we want to move on to the? Sure. Do you want to move with the statement on cybersecurity? Yeah, that would be great. So um, you mean from the? Yeah, when we get into the IT governance, the exam priorities, we wanted to, before we start talking about the role of CCO, which you're all probably very interested in, 
the um, exam priorities did emphasize that compliance programs and CCO in particular play critical roles um, in firms and, and they did identify the hallmarks of effective compliance is compliance that's very active in most facets of firm operations, probably not too surprising there. And secondly, knowledgeable and empowered CCOs with full responsibility, authority and resources to develop and enforce policies and procedures at the firm were two things that the exam priorities in the introductory men, uh, message emphasized. So, Let's move into IT governance, the role of the CCO. Alexis, what are your thoughts on effective IT governance? Sure, and just before we get into that, if you don't mind, I just sure. wanted to make a few statements about um, the cybersecurity um, observational, op operational resiliency observations, um, just because we did talk about them in the context of SEC expectations. I just want to um, put them in their proper uh, context. So the first thing I just wanted to note was that these observations aren't designed to change regulatory obligations or to provide guidance on existing, um, existing ones. And we included observations from a variety of regulated entities, so including clearing agencies, um, investment advisors, broker dealers, and exchanges. So given that, and also given the fact that there's not one size fits all approach, we do understand that not all the practices outlined in that statement um, would be appropriate for all uh, entities. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, add that context to that document. Anything else before we go to IT governance on the risk alerts? No. no. Okay. Okay. A role of the CCO and effective IT governments governance. Uh, Alexis, what are your thoughts there? So as far as effective governance, um, some of the things that we're looking for would be senior level engagement where you know, devoting appropriate board and senior leadership attention to setting the strategy and overseeing the organization's cybersecurity program. Another um, component of uh, effective governance would be a risk assessment, and that's developing and conducting a risk assessment process to identify, manage, and mitigate cyber risk relevant to the organization's business. And what we're looking here is that they're actually taking the firm's um, particular business model into consideration. Um, so, for example, things that we would expect you to um, consider would be whether or not you have remote or traveling employees, you know, whether or not there are certain insider threats, do you have international operations. Um, then we would expect policies and procedures um, that are tailored to the firm itself and also address some of those risks that were identified in the risk assessment. Next, testing and monitoring, you know, establishing a testing and monitoring program to validate how effective those policies and procedures actually are. Um, and then, you know, based on the result of that testing and monitoring to promptly, um, you know, remedy any deficiencies you might see in those, in those policies and procedures. Um, also, communication is important. Establishing internal and external communication policies and procedures to provide timely information to decision makers, customers, other market participants, and regulators. So I think those would be, you know, the, the key areas of, of good governance that, that we would cite in OC. And any, anything about governance of the people and the roles with the CCO um, and in, in the governance of the organization? So, are you asking about the like what we would expect of the CCO? Yeah, the communicate more, more the communication, the, the CCO, and how risks are communicated with sure. throughout the organization. And, and I think it's important, you know, when we go on exam, we do look to see how um, how information is communicated up also uh, to the board um, to to make sure that they are engaged and they do understand um, some of the risk involved in in the in the IT structure of the organization. Um, you know, their engagement is, is important, and sometimes, you know, this could happen uh, directly to the board. We've also seen board committees. Um, just as long as we see that there are effective communication mechanisms um, up to the board and then, and then down as well. So then let's, let's talk about the chief compliance officer um, or a risk manager. I mean, they're not necessarily born into the most technical roles and familiar with all the technicalities of an information security program. How can, you know, technically conversant do they need to be? Let me turn over to, to Ryan and EJ for that. No, sir. Apologies. Okay, well, I think um, it's a great question. Uh, I think the way that uh, Alexis has phrased the, uh, 
the use of governance and the expectations with respect to governance are the right way to think about uh, cybersecurity. Um, but when you're a chief compliance officer or you're a member of a compliance team tasked with implementing that governance, um, you know, I think it's important to understand what do we mean by governance? You know, governance means driving, steering. It means uh, you know, directing. Um, so governance necessarily entails having the right control uh, structures in place uh, that can be effective at understanding the relevant risks to your firm and understanding whether or not you're properly assessing and, and appreciating those risks and remedying those risks, you know, to your point. Um, so I think, you know, when I think of strong IT governance, strong cybersecurity governance, I think it really comes down to having those, you know, appropriate control structures, you know, policies and procedures, strong uh, lines of communication within the firm, uh, both between different departments and from departments up to uh, senior management to uh, you know the C-suite uh, to the board. Um, I think governance comes down to uh, having clearly defined roles and responsibilities so that no one person can point the finger and say, well, hey, I didn't think cyber was my problem. I thought it was that department's problem. Uh, so I think that, that communication is key. Um, and by having all of those components addressed, I, I think firms can really tackle uh, cybersecurity governance. Um, I'd be surprised if, if anyone in this room uh, would say, you know, I'm, I'm a self-described, uh, you know, cybersecurity expert. I think everyone in this room would likely agree with the statement that your main job is compliance. You're in a compliance role or you're in an operational role, and cybersecurity is just one of many risk items on your radar. So I think it's important to keep that in mind, and, and how do we tackle that? It's, it's through these governance structures. Yeah, Ryan, just, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just to add on to what you just said, which I thought was very um, well put in terms of the definition of governance, right? You're guiding and, and directing. <clears throat> I think one of the things that I'd like to echo onto that and add to it is the desire to speak, we talked about this in the Red Room, the language, right? Mm -hmm. Understand the conversations and being somewhat conversant is challenging, right? Technology, terms change all the time. Um, there's a a lingo that is hard to follow, but it's one of those things where if you are engaging on a regular basis, you start to develop a comfort level, not just with the words, but asking that very important question of what does that mean, right? That's a very powerful word for any CCO to think about is what does that mean, right? If you don't know, ask the question, and then you can become more knowledgeable and understanding of it, and having a regular relationship and a regular rapport with your IT teams, with the cyber team, uh, audit, <clears throat> uh, frontline managers who are engaged in different activities relative to you know, um, you know, cloud services they're acquiring or utilizing to better satisfy clients. Having a regular conversation and asking these questions, what does this mean and how does it relate to risk? What does this mean? How does this relate to what I already learned last month, right? Building upon is a key part of building your own lexicon understanding of that language. You know, we all don't need to necessarily know Italian when we go to Rome, but it does help to know Albania, you know, where's the bathroom? And same thing for technology, right? It's important to understand terminologies and words and understanding to put yourself in a position where you're not surprised when things happen. I think you identified a key point is, is um, it's often hard for people who are unfamiliar with an area to ask questions about it because they're unfamiliar, they're uncomfortable, they don't know where to start, they don't necessarily want to be asking that of someone in the organization who's maybe a peer or maybe close to a peer or um, you don't want to appear, appear stupid. So one thing that we often talk to our general counsel about or a new in-house counsel who's in cybersecurity and has to get up to speed is find sort of a trusted advisor. And maybe it is taking a week off and going to a basic security 101 course where you can establish a rapport with someone and ask all those questions. Um, you've got to have a way to learn it on your own and it's often hard to do that um, with, you know, depending on various people in the organizations and information security professionals are, uh, you know, their own discipline and, and sometimes they're oil and water with lawyers and probably not that different with, with compliance. So it may not be so easy for you to get up to speed and get comfortable with the group and the, 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 you're the head of the group that you're interacting with in security, but find someone to do that um, or some way to do that. And of course, we see that happening with like geek squads, right? You know, elderly people calling them all the time to learn how to operate iPhones and different things. It's really no different um, in this area of finding ways to become comfortable to ask those questions. I think you're exactly right. I think it's, um, I think we're in agreement that uh, compliance and IT are not always speaking the same language. So I think it's important to try to find that common ground. 
Uh, and, and I think it's a, um, a mandate on both sides. You know, from the compliance standpoint, it's important to be asking those questions. Similarly, uh, from the standpoint of an IT professional, it's important to make sure that uh, those individuals are explaining terms uh, so that their colleagues can, can understand and, and so that everyone is in, on the same page. Um, yeah, I think too often uh, IT professionals will use, you know, technobabble uh, to, to sound smarter or, or even just because they just assume that everyone they're speaking with speaks the same language. Uh, so it's important to ask those questions and it's important for IT to honestly explain things in plain English so that you can reach that common ground. And that happens quite a bit. Um, we, we definitely see, you know, for efficiency purposes or whatever, the technical people might use more technical descriptions um, than it's easily understandable. So given that sort of common state of affairs, how can a compliance officer be comfortable that the answers they're getting aren't filtered, um, that there's not a red flag there in the environment? and I only know from experience from years and years um, of trying to understand and hearing the language about how difficult that could be. In one situation I had a client that was a very large global client that all their peer organizations had a security operations center. It was established but their company didn't and years and years and years the CISO would explain why and it was com seemed completely rational but if you step back they should have had that. I mean, with the, 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 how, the breadth of, and depth of the footprint that the organization, organization had. So how, how can we address that issue? I want to take this one first. <clears throat> sure. I mean, uh, you know, trust but, uh, trust but verify is a key part of this. And I think, um, I don't want to say go hire outside consultants, right? That's a little self-serving. Um, but it is important to bring outsiders in to take a look at what IT is doing. And sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes it's a, it's a, a pain based on personalities organizationally to validate. If you're not in the process of doing that, how do you independently verify that what you're hearing makes sense? Well, it's always good to, I, I always tell people that I'm counseling, ask for things in writing. You know, IT will spin a wheel of, of words that they think will get you out of their office and back to what they're doing. Um, you know, it happens. Um, so ask for it in writing. Like, great, put it down. And then you have an opportunity to break apart words and phrases and say, what does this mean? How does this relate? What does this relate? And also over time, right? Chart progression over time. How is this changing, right? Oh, we stopped 3,000, we stopped 3 million threats this week. Is that a lot? I don't know, right? So as you track and look the metrics and see where it goes, and then also go to your peer groups. We referenced ISACs earlier. There are lots of data points that are out there that are publicly available to help uh, organizations find more information about how they're doing benchmark their progress and find other steps. And actually, and to your point earlier about getting familiar, I quickly looked up because a friend of mine used to teach there. Uh, Georgia Tech has a free class on Udacity, right? You can start taking classes for free uh, from Georgia Tech, a great program on cybersecurity, right? So you can go off and become smarter yourself on the weekends and learn how you know these different things relate and find more of the piece of information on your own. So I hate to say it's a trust but validate, but in many ways is understanding, um, it's, it's causing someone to say, I believe you, but I want to just find other ways of validating the points that you make. Is there some guidance <clears throat> for risk assessments, which of course is the cornerstone of all of, of the information security programs, how often to bring in an external consultant to do a risk assessment or a pen test or a vulnerability scan? That's a great question. I, I do think uh, there are a wide range of, of firms represented in this room. I think that's one of the great things about uh, about this conference. I think it brings a lot of you know, representative groups together. Um, so what works for one firm is not necessarily going to work uh, for the next firm. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, that being said, there are certainly a lot of uh, great industry resources out there that can be used as, as starting points for conducting a risk assessment, for um, evaluating the adequacy of your cybersecurity program. Uh, you know, certainly the, uh, the SEC's um, you know, cybersecurity exam initiatives are, are largely informed by um, you know, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, you know, that framework in and of itself takes the best of the best of, of other cybersecurity frameworks. So I think you certainly can't go wrong by using that as, as one point of reference. Um, and it, honestly, it could be as simple as taking the SEC's published risk alerts and published guidance, sitting down with your staff, sitting down with your compliance team, uh, or if it's just you, uh, you know, sitting down with the CCO and um, your IT vendor or your IT team, your IT department, uh, sitting down with other individuals in an operational role, work through those items and, and say, hey, what's our answer to this question? Or 
do we have documentation to answer the next question? How do we support, you know, question three? Do we have anything, or, or is this not applicable? I think it's just as important to identify which risks are not applicable to your firm as it is to identify what is applicable to the firm. Um, and, to, and to build on uh, you know, what was mentioned earlier, I think um, you know, what would be a red flag for a firm in, in conducting a risk assessment? Um, two red flags come to mind for me. Um, you know, one is if, a, if an individual in an IT or cybersecurity role tells you as the compliance officer that there are no vulnerabilities. <laughs> I have yet to see a firm with no vulnerabilities, and if the firm has no vulnerabilities, I, I think they're not looking hard enough, or or they're just not plugged into the internet. I think they're completely disconnected from the internet because I don't see how that's uh, ultimately feasible. Um, it, it, it can happen uh, if you have vulnerabilities on your system uh, that are very difficult for a hacker to find. Um, you know, maybe, you're, maybe you're secure enough, I, I guess I would use that phrasing. Um, but yeah, if your IT individual is telling you uh, time and time again that there's no vulnerabilities, nothing to look out for, um, you know, you're in good shape and you're in good hands and, and you know, don't lift up the hood. Uh, and that would be the second uh, red flag in my experience. An IT individual who is unwilling to uh, let compliance or let the compliance function or to let a third party come in and independently validate that you're doing what you say you're doing. One thing before we answer the question that um, we're in an era now where it's trust but verify. Mm -hmm. And one thing we talk to lawyers about a lot is artifacts of compliance. So one way to work through the potential red flag issue is to sit down, as you mentioned, go through the list and they'll rattle off, we have this endpoint security and this monitoring in place and patch management and critical vulnerabilities in 30 days. You just ask for, hey, could I, could I, could you pull that up? Could I see that report of the mm -hmm. pen test? Could I see the risk assessment? Can I see the, you know, corrective action plan? Um, you just want to just see something. And once you start to see it, the whole dynamic and dialogue starts to change. But it's good to see too, because that's the way we educate ourselves. So that's one uh, way we can help work through that issue. I saw a question. Yeah, please. We're, uh, I'm the CEO of a small firm and I'm not a uh, cyber. Guy. Do you have like uh, a checklist that you recommend? Like you say, can you answer these questions? Do you have something that you think is a good place for us to do an internal risk assessment from? Go through and say, yeah, these are the questions and you can answer them. One thing that we recommend is the critical security controls. Uh, there's six basic um, controls, and they, there's a nice map they have on, on their website. Um, you can email me, I'll give it to you later. But those six controls, we would definitely recommend sort of walking through at a very basic level. Um, that's kind of our starting place. But go ahead, EJ or Ryan. Yeah, I would say there's certainly a lot of uh, resources out there. Um, Sometimes uh, you know it can seem that there are too many resources out there, and you know where does one start? Where does one begin if if it seems like there's a lot of noise out there? Um, I, I would agree. I think there are certainly some places that are more um, reachable than others, more uh, digestible by by a smaller or mid-sized advisor. Um, I know that uh, you know NASA um, has put out a, a cybersecurity checklist for state-registered advisors. Um, it, it's NASA with uh, two A's. Uh, they've come out with a model cybersecurity rule for state registered advisors, and I, I think it's more designed for uh, firms on the smaller end of the spectrum, uh, just in terms of the way that it addresses some of the expectations and, and controls. Uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum, I would say, is the NIST cybersecurity framework, or even um, you know, going through an ISO 27001 you know, certification or audit and, and the uh, expectations of the formality of that type of a, a control environment. And then there's everything in between, which would be the uh, you know the, the critical uh, securities controls, um, and other you know industry sources. I think there's certainly a lot of resources out there, and I think what you'll find is in looking at that guidance, they do tend to all uh, whether you're looking at the uh, you know the NASA um, you know cybersecurity checklist for uh, for small firms, or if you're looking at the NIST cybersecurity framework, a lot of those requirements, whether it's you know. 15 items in one or 100 items in the NIST framework can all be distilled to the uh, to the six topical risk areas that Alexis has uh, has mentioned that the SEC is interested in. Yeah, <clears throat> just to add on to it. So it's um, the website. It would be CI. So Charlie Indigo Security.org. I used to work for CIS. Okay. <laughs> so I've quoted that a lot. Um, and they do. It's the top 20. So right, mm -hmm. it's 20 specific key actions. As Kimberly expertly pointed out, mm -hmm. the six baseline basics that you want to do are the ones that theoretically stop up to 85% of all attacks, right? Mm -hmm. So 
the Australian DSD did a test of about 3,000 different simulated attacks that hit their network, and they identified that these six control areas actually did stop at 85% of attacks. The remaining 15, or 14 controls were there, give, give or take, stopped the other remaining 12%, getting about 97% security. What does that mean? It means you still can't sleep at night. Um, <laughs> but you can at least feel a little better about what you've done. So I would echo what EJ said about CIS uh, as a great guidance point. I also say, I've advised clients in the past to look at the New York State DFS. Right, it's a, actually the New York State DFS standards is a very prescriptive guidance, right? It's a completely identifying key actions you do, application software, pen testing, having a CISO. Um, these are metrics that if you need to find something to stand behind and you're not at a point, they align, they cover some areas of the six, not all of the areas, but they cover a lot of it. And it gives you a point of reference to kind of identify against yourself. So I consider that one as well as another mid-level one. But you're just completely right. If you're looking to go higher up the chain, NIST has a ton of documentation. What's great about NIST too is they, it's free and there's gobs of it. You need to understand how to do a, a, a risk assessment, you go to NIST 800-30. You want to understand uh, access controls, NIST 800-171. It's unending the amount of stuff they do. So if you're wondering where attack dollars go to, there you go. <laughs> uh, but it's a great place to get more information. Mm -hmm. I just caution that it might be for a small firm, trying to wrap your hands around all of NIST might be a lot. So I would encourage CIS uh, as a base to start. Uh, or even, like I said, the DFS as a place to start looking at to say if we're going to hold ourselves to a standard that is one that has some market trend. Okay, I've moved on to the next slide. Here's specific areas in information security that come up time and time again. Multi-factor authentication, encryption, training and vendor due diligence. On multi-factor authentication, of course, email account compromises are probably in the top five uh, types of attacks. Um, any account we have that can access data that single factor is at risk, right, from all the credentials that are on, on sale. What do companies need to be thinking about with multi-factor? Uh, I'll take this one to start. I think it's important to understand uh, first, you know, what multi-factor authentication is. It's, it's, you know, typically something you know and, and something you have, or it's, uh, you know, two different forms uh, of authentication, two different forms uh, that you can prove you are who you say you are. Um, I've had a few people actually ask me, you know, what about a username and password? Are those, is that two-factor? I said, no. I said, the username <laughs> is you saying, you know, hi, I'm EJ. Your password is saying, okay, here's how I prove that I'm EJ. And then a second factor is uh, another way to say, yes, I'm EJ. Um, but the username and password is not the two-factor authentication. Uh, typically, two-factor authentication uh, it's most commonly manifested in um, you know, a text message as being the second factor. You know, the, the website that you're logging into, after you put in your username and password, it'll send you a text message to a phone number that you already have registered with the system. Um, taking a step up from there, it could be an application, it could be you know, an app on your phone that uh, a one-time password or PIN will, will appear there and you know, reset itself every you know, 60 seconds or so. Um, you know, the app-based authentication tends to be a little bit more secure than uh, a text message authentication because hackers have learned that, hey, if, if I can just text somebody and say, you know, hey, I, I've, I'm Google and I see that you're logging into Google, um, but I, you know, for security reasons, I want to know your second factor. Well, if you respond to that, um, that text message, well, now the hacker has that second uh, authentication and if they act within 60 seconds, they can theoretically log into your account. Um, Another way that I see it is, um, you know, token-based. There, there are various, you know, it's actually a hardware token, and, you know, can fit on your keychain, and again, it just resets a password every 60 seconds or so, and that number is associated with your account. But um, so I think, you know, defining two-factor authentication um, at the outset, understanding what it is, uh, and then where would I use it? I would, I would use two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication uh, anywhere you have sensitive information. Um, worth protecting. Uh, anywhere where that information is of value to you as a person or to you as, you know, um, you know a guardian of that data for your company. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily use two-factor authentication for something where I'm just a consumer of information. Uh, if I've signed up for a newsletter and I have a username and password there, that second factor doesn't really add any value. Um, but if it's my bank, absolutely. Yeah, just to add on to that. Yeah. Um, do you have a feeling about whether multi-factor authentication is important in like, your, your at work, your at your workstation at work versus when I'm traveling here and I'm not that? Do you, do you feel that there's, that it's obviously it's much more critical when you're traveling, but is it necessary for like, that work? Yeah. 
I'll take that. Yep. Yes. Um, there, and I, I mean that because there's only, the purpose of multi-factor isn't just to protect your um, equipment, it's to protect your account, and your account is vulnerable from many places, right? So if I have access to your username and password, whether I'm in Romania or I'm in, you know, Rome, I can access it. But if I have to have your phone, then I'm stopped. Right? I'm gonna go find somebody else who I have the username and password, right? Most people think hacking is this, you know, sophisticated operation where I'm wearing a hoodie and I'm heading into, I just go break into the Smash Mouth fan forums and I pull out the information from there and I try a bunch of username and passwords and see who opens up. But if any of them come back and say, oh, you actually need to have a authentication thing, then I'm stopped. I'm gonna go after somebody else who is a Smash Mouth fan and I have the username and password because they use the same username and password at the Smash Mouth forum as they did on the work account. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, not for Smash Mouth. I don't know who's really a big fan of Smash Mouth anymore, but you know, you know, it, it happens all the time, right? I mean, I, I was part of a nationwide alert to. Um, there was a breach of uh, this made the news of Ashley Madison, which was a extramarital affairs website. I don't know. I don't use it. Uh, I'm happily married, um, uh, and. We had to notify, so I was working with the U.S. government at the time, and we had to notify thousands upon thousands of state and local employees, or excuse me, the IT directors of these organizations, about thousands and thousands of state and local employees who we said, listen, if you don't have two-factor authentication, you need to change this username and password immediately because it's out there in the wild. Because of course, when you're cheating your spouse, you don't use your personal uh, email address, you use your work email address, uh, which they use easy to find. So multi-factor stops those kind of events, right? So it's not so much just what you have and how it is, it's, it's your account and where it's sitting, which is on the internet. So anything I can do to make it more difficult, leveraging the second factor, as EJ well put it, makes it so that the attackers are gonna go somewhere else. Yeah, it's a great question uh, because I, I, I have seen some firms um, put the two-factor authentication in place as a, as a catch-all to, to say, okay, well, that's our, our bare minimum. We're going to have two-factor authentication, but you know, adding um, an exception to that, where if you're logging in from you know an IP address that is is within your office uh, bounds, that maybe it doesn't prompt you for the second factor as often. You know, I have seen some firms lessen but, the strength of, but that of the other bounds. that would be a second factor. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, so it's that second factor because you have yeah you're, you're limiting it by IP address. You're saying okay, if this computer recognizes that I'm logging in from an office environment. That's correct. That, that IP address would be that second factor. So you don't necessarily need um, you know, the token or the uh, the pin at that point. Is there one area where you're seeing companies generally not implement MFA, where it could be cost effective and easy to do, and and drop off the risk of cyber attacks? One area that jumps to mind potentially is email, right? Accessing email mm -hmm. from a browser um, requiring a second factor rather than just a username and password. Yeah, I've seen email uh, as the biggest area to get pushback from employees, but also the strongest area where it's the most helpful to have. Yeah, <clears throat> that ter it terrifies me to think about people who have email yeah. that you have to, you can just use your username and password to log in. Because when, as I just said example before, if my username and password is compromised, then all my emails are compromised. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like to believe I don't have anything that sensitive in my email that shouldn't be there, but I mean, we all know our coworkers, how much stuff is actually in their email addresses. Moving on to encryption, big topic, right? Um, we generally have some sense that sensitive data should be encrypted, but what does that mean? Does that mean the, the, the laptop itself, you have whole disk, disk encryption, or the server itself, you have encryption on the server, or do we have to be encrypting at the file level and the data level? Do you want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, encryption is one of those things where it's like brushing your yeah. teeth. You should do it regularly. You should do it well. You should do it yourself. Um, <laughs> so it's it's something that I think a lot of organizations uh, they think about it after the fact because it's it's an, it, it causes issues. So to your point about you know file level, uh, I think in the future most things are going to the cloud, right? Most of us are putting our data in the cloud. We're using cloud-based applications. Enforcing encryption on there is very important because if access is broken down. What data is there should be encrypted as well too, but I think these smart devices is really where you see the big value add for encryption. Because if you have the data encrypted, if it gets lost, you're okay in most requirements, right? If you have an encrypted smartphone and the data on there and the smartphone gets lost, it's okay. If the laptop with encryption on the laptop, you're okay. Um, 
server level encryption, other things like that is very important. I think there's, if they get into your servers, there's usually other aspects they've gotten into. A lot of times the encryption is tied to the AD or the Active Directory so that they can decrypt the data anyway. Um, but encryption is one of those things that you want to have in place, especially as at the level of the sensitivity of the data that's involved, right? So if there's any chance that sensitive data is involved that could be involved in breach, it is a good idea to consider encryption. And it's consider encryption in light of um, resources already out there, right? Windows comes with encryption baked into it. There's all sorts of different solution sets that you can just turn on that encryption is standard. My iPhone has encryption baked into it. I can just encrypt the hard, the hard drive of my iPhone. It takes, you know, a couple minutes. So I think there's not too many reasons not to take encryption steps. I think it just comes down to what other factors are you doing in and around encryption and thinking through the process by which the encryption is done. Yeah, I think uh, if I could just add a few points to uh, the use of encryption. Um, I think the level of encryption needs to match uh, what it is that you're protecting. Um, you know, the analogy I like to use is if I'm storing garden tools in the shed, I don't need a Fort Knox lock on those garden tools. Um, you know, unless they're made of you know platinum or something, I, I don't need to you know lock that multiple times. Um, the value just isn't there. Um, if you're protecting you know your house, if you're protecting your family, uh, something you know more valuable. Um, you'll want stronger locks. You'll want stronger protections in place. Think of encryption the same way. Um, if the data that's behind that login or password or if the data on that device or computer is valuable to the firm, is valuable to you as a person, um, it should be encrypted. Um, the encryption you know, should match what it is that you're protecting. Um, if you have a, a folder on your uh, network drive that's just lunch menus from local restaurants, do you need to encrypt that folder? No. Uh, but if it's you know usernames, passwords, if it's uh, you know client account numbers, uh, if it's anything of you know particular value to the company, or if it meets one of these you know state breach uh, notification requirements um, in terms of personal identifiable information, yes, I think it should be encrypted. Uh, the cost of encryption has come down quite a bit. The cost of encryption, relative to the financial cost, if that data is breached. It's, it's a no-brainer. Um, you know, for, for less than $100, you can encrypt a laptop versus how much will it cost you if that laptop is stolen and it wasn't encrypted. Um, and the final point I'll make is, and, and this gets back to our uh, prior discussion, how do you know if your IT person is trying to pull the wool over your eyes? Uh, ask for proof. Uh, trust but verify. Encryption is a great way to do that. Um, I can't tell you how many firms I've been to in the last year where I've asked the CCO and I've asked the IT person, are you encrypting your data? And the response almost always is yes. We're encrypting data at rest. All of our laptops are encrypted. And my next question is always, prove it. <laughs> and at least half the time, I find laptops not encrypted. So it's, you need to ask for that proof. Yes? So if the laptop is encrypted, does that mean that everything you send or receive through the laptop is encrypted? Or does that mean I still have to worry about what I send to somebody else <coughs> on that laptop, the data that I'm sending? That's a great question. Uh, the laptop encryption applies to the data while it's being stored, but once you're sending that, that data over the internet, um, you also need to apply encryption uh, in transit. Um, you know, some email programs uh, have it baked in. Um, I tend not to trust email for sending anything sensitive. Uh, I would use a, a you know, a secure portal uh, where you're posting the information to that, that portal securely and your recipient <coughs> just gets a link and they have to log in and authenticate themselves and then they can get the information. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it, they're two different things in transit and at rest. Yeah, it's a, yeah to, to echo it. I mean, that's where you start talking like the file level encryption, right? Sensitive yeah. files to each is a great point. You know, that's the mm -hmm. ones that get the Fort Knox. You know, things that are mm -hmm. very critical. So as they transmit, no matter how they move through your hands or your third party's hands or somebody else's hands, they stay encrypted, at least until they get decrypted. One point about encrypted hard, uh, laptops, very important, they don't sticky note the password to the laptop onto it. No, no laughter. That has happened way more often than I think EJ and I want to admit to people. Um, it is no longer secure. <laughs> you cannot continue to be secure because it happens all the time. So I think the takeaway here is that encryption is probably one area where it would make a lot of sense to just read about a little bit, easy Google searches, what's encryption at rest, 
what's encryption you know, in transit, um, some of the questions you asked. You may be asking of that of your vendors and they'll, sell, they'll tell you our data's encrypted or your IT say, will say your data's encrypted, but there's multiple levels and you have to be aware of the risk because it's such an important concept. If your data truly is encrypted and someone accesses it and they can't access it, it's a get out of jail free card under most legal standards, data breach laws worldwide. So it's incredibly important. And if it, it can be a throwaway where someone just says, your data's encrypted. You really want to understand if it's sitting on a server in a database, and they say, oh, it's, it's encrypted. If, that, if they're just saying your server's encrypted, um, that, that's good, but that also means that someone with credentials and can get full access to all the data, and that's a way that many of these data breaches happen. The server will be encrypted, but not the data on the server will be encrypted. So, and that may be okay if there's other protections in place. It's kind of defense in depth, but it's a good area to ask some probing questions on to get some understanding of the risk of the sensitive data um, and how it's protected. Um, vendor due diligence, let's just cover that at a high level vis-a-vis -vis, um, very large service providers, cloud providers. We, we talk a lot about doing due diligence and risk due diligence and having contracts that you know, are specify how they're going to hold your data, what, you're gonna, you know, what protections they'll have, and then you have a very large cloud service provider where you may not be able to no negotiate anything. So what are some strategies for vendor due diligence with large service providers? or cloud providers? Oh, <clears throat> sure, so it's always a challenge to do with the big guys, right? So we do with a lot of organizations who are assessing their third parties from small to large. Um, when we're dealing with the cloud service providers, their contracts are, are going to be aligned in a way that makes sense for them, right, obviously. Uh, so, but I think they also understand this shared services model. Basically what it is is understanding of where you, their responsibilities to you end and where your responsibilities to secure your data start. And clarity and understanding that role is critical here. Um, and not just with the big guys, right? The ones who utilize the big guys. You know, Salesforce is operating on different cloud platforms. Understanding what data Salesforce has, understanding what data AWS has or Azure has underneath them um, <coughs> is a very important part of all these conversations. So when you're doing vendor due diligence, our experience has generally been have that conversation external as much as you can with the vendors, but where you cannot, because you're dealing with Amazon or you're dealing with Azure or another cloud provider, have it internally. How are we dealing with this cloud service provider? How are we handling the data that we're sharing with them? What aspects of the data do we retain control over? Where is our responsibility ending and where is their responsibility beginning? There are different ways of doing it, right? You can purchase from as Amazon a configuration that's set up to match best practices for hardening or not. You can put it on a hosted cloud that is only accessible from the United States or not. Like you have to work through a lot of these conversations internally say, what are our requirements to work with this vendor? How are we managing this relationship? And how are we, are we truly understanding the data we share with them and what they're gonna do to protect it? They're happy to have that conversation, but just don't, don't forget that there is this model in the cloud services world, especially shared services model where it very upfront, you are responsible for your part. And they'll tell you where that part is and then they can help you work way back from that too. But there's always a give and take in that conversation. Yeah, I think it was great that the SEC actually came out with guidance uh, on the use of cloud storage providers and, and guidance with respect to um, just the fact that vendor due diligence as a topic, as a risk management concern, uh, is consistently reflected in the, uh, the SEC's examination priorities. Um, Alexis, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, if you can weigh in on uh, you know, the, the importance of vendor due diligence, um, but I mean, it, I have seen it on the last few SEC exam priorities, so it does seem like it's, it is something important to, uh, to get right. It is important to get right. I, you know, I just want to note that there is no exception um, to the requirement to protect customer information because you use a vendor. You still have the, the same requirements, so one of the things, you know, to keep in mind, um, regardless of whether you're using a a big vendor that's very difficult to contract with. Um, you know, when we go on examination, um, it's, it's, we're not going, it's not going to be a mitigating <clears throat> circumstance that, you know, you, you couldn't get that in the contract or, you know, or, or not having an understanding of, um, you know, I, or not having an understanding of how that data is protected or even whether or not it is protected. Um, last year we published a risk alert. Um, that specifically relates to safeguarding customer uh, data on various networks, uh, storage solutions, including cloud. Um, and in there, we just kind of pointed out a few observations that we had in that area. 
um, one of the things that we noted is that you know the majority of the network storage solutions did offer security features such as encryption and password protection, but firms didn't always configure uh, the security settings to, to um, protect against unauthorized access. We saw where firms didn't have policies and procedures addressing security configuration, and we also noted that misconfigured settings often resulted from a lack of effective oversight um, when the storage solution was initially implemented. Um, we also noted that, um, and I think we, we touched about on this a little bit before, um, data classification policies and procedures, where policies and procedures didn't always identify the different types of data stored electronically by the firm and the appropriate controls for that data. So these are all things that need to be considered um, when you, it, engaging a service provider such as a cloud provider that, that you know, it has security settings you're going to have to establish policies and procedures, standards, um, and apply those standards to those security settings uh, in the cloud um, service space. And, the, and we did note a few um, effective practices. Um, one was, you know, we saw where firms were implementing policies and procedures designed to support initial installation, ongoing maintenance, and regular review of the network storage solution, establishing guidelines for security controls and baseline security configuration standards to ensure that each network solution is configured properly, and also implementing effective vendor management policies and procedures. You know, that's one of the things that we really look for. And we don't have, you know, specific obligations, but we do want to see that there is a process in place um, and that you are adhering to that process. Uh, we want to see documentation. We, if we want to see your policies and procedures, and we want to see, you know, what controls you have in place, and we also want to see evidence that you're actually enforcing those policies and procedures, and those controls are actually in place. You know, if you think of this, go ahead. Question? Yeah, I love about that. Time passwords in general, and frequency changing passwords, but we push down quarterly, and we still have people change the whole school things. But like, you have that mitigating factor, like the multi-factor. Does that Yes, I think the, the latest guidance from NIST uh, echoes that exact point. It, it, um, I believe it states that as long as you have a, a strong password, um, frequently changing that password is not necessarily going to make it more secure because what do people do? They're just going to change the last couple characters. Um, or they're going to re start recycling old passwords. You know, if, if you make people change it quarterly, uh, but you don't enforce a password history, well, you're going to start seeing that, okay, well, I'll change it this quarter. Next quarter, when I have to change it again, I'll make it back to what I had as a password the first quarter. Um, I think NIST recognized uh, that concern and advocates for having a strong password that meets complexity requirements uh, and having a second factor as being more secure than, than you know, enforcing a lot of changes to that password, just for that reason. Um, again, I think it depends on what, what you're protecting and what the uh, systems are. Um, but strong being more the guideline versus the multi-factor. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Layered. Yep. I mean, I, I would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the strong is key. Multi-factor is even better. Mm -hmm. And strong being, you know, mm -hmm. 14 characters, uh, words that are not sensical, uh, and number of characters are helpful. Mm -hmm. But more than 14 characters. Password manager apps. That is a great example of risk management. Do I want to have multiple passwords for many accounts? So if there's a compromise, I don't. It's only one issue, or do I want to have one thing get compromised and everything's an issue? But I trust that one thing very much. I, I leave that to, to you to decide. Honestly, <laughs> uh, it's a it's an exercise of risk management password. Man. I, LastPass and those companies are great. I think they do a good job of securing things. They've been breached and they've been public about it. Um, but they've been breached and their data was encrypted. So mm -hmm. passwords were safe and there's protections. So um, it's an exercise in risk management. So if someone can compromise your last pass account because they figured out your password is all your, your, your pet's names in a row with the, you know, a string of numbers at the end, then you're in trouble. But if you don't want to have to remember 25 different passwords, that's a benefit too. So, but if you put a second factor on your password manager, then you're covered. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's probably a good way to do it. So it has multi-factor authentication on it, and it's something that, that protects that password. So you're not trying to use the same password over and over again. It's got, in you know, words and yeah, things right. like that. So they're they're not going to get into that. Most likely not. 
question? So this this highlight last couple of questions is sort of brought out that, that the standards are, are evolving, number one, the challenges are evolving. And number two, there are a couple of different ways to go about this, right? There's, there's judgment here. From the exam program's perspective, when you see a cyber deficiency, what tips the scales for you of when that becomes an enforcement problem versus something that you're telling the restaurant kind of correct? And I, I think a lot of it has to do with impact for us. Um, what is the impact to customer? And if you and if you see um, some of the you know enforcement cases, they're usually cases um, where there had been a lot of impact to customers, where there is monetary loss, as opposed to cases where you know as the exam program we might see um, we might see you know some deficiencies, or we might see areas that that there's room for improvement, but there wasn't necessarily a breach. And, there's, and that's just one example. There are a lot of different considerations that go into whether or not something goes from like the exam space to the enforcement space. And there's even considerations that even if we do make a referral to enforcement, whether or not they're interested in taking it. So it, it's not, you know, I, I, I wish I could set out, you know, this, you know, process or approach that we have, but a lot of it just comes down to um, impact and, and whether or not, you know, we, we do work with folks in enforcement and whether or not we feel as though it's something they would be interested in pursuing. Question? I think the SEC is actually. Um, Do you want to repeat that speech. question? Uh, the, the question <laughs> is, um, if I can, uh, you know, distill it, um, when conducting vendor due diligence or risk management generally, um, you know, is having some residual risk okay as long as you have a robust process in place? Yeah, or yeah, being able to evidence with, with management um, as part of the conversation that we've gotten to a level that it's acceptable and that we can then I'd be curious to hear uh, Alexis's uh, view on that, but I, I think um, the SEC has uh, published a, a you know a staff um, speech in which um, and I can't recall uh, who it was. But one of the commissioners uh, stated that cybersecurity risk is not something to eliminate; it's something to manage. And I think that exactly addresses what you're getting at: that having a process in place to effectively deal with cybersecurity risk as it increases, as it decreases down to a level that's acceptable to the firm and hopefully doesn't cause impact to clients, um, I think is what it's all about. I think trying to get to that point, um, I don't think you can eliminate cybersecurity risk. I don't think any firm out there can say, we're secure, we're done, I'm going to walk away, like, you know, no more cyber. Uh, I don't think it's possible. Right. Yeah, and what we'd like to see, um, again, is, you know, that there's a process in place and that you're following that process and that there there is documentation and evidence that you're following that process. So, you know, we, we don't expect you to get your risk down to zero. We do expect that there will be some residual risk. Um, but how, how, how do you handle that residual risk? How do you accept that residual risk? You know, what, what, what folks are involved? Like, is there an exception process? We just, we're really concerned, and this is not just in the, in the area of risk, but just across the board, we're looking at policies, procedures, processes, and how, whether or not you are actually enforcing them um, and following those policies, procedures, and processes. And I think <clears throat> there are other standards out there beyond the SEC, although I appreciate Alexis's perspective there, and um, the California CCPA, for example, reasonable. And that sounds reasonable. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not the Attorney General for California, but 
the way you've outlined it, understanding inherent risk, we're building a framework around it, trying to seek out, you know, what are what can we mitigate, what can we transfer, how can we deal with it, and having a comprehensive documented framework to Alexis's point that starts demonstrating reasonableness. Now, the courts are going to decide those things, what is reasonable, what is not, and there's scale factors, right? I mean, if you're a five-person shop and you've got that mentality, that's exceptional. If you're a 500,000-person company and you're kind of approaching it like that, that's delinquent. Um, so I think there's a reasonableness factor that goes into play here, but I think in many ways that's what many of the regulators are trying to get their hands around is what, when I see bad, I'll know it. And it's usually because there's a lack of reasonableness in the approach. And I, and I would agree with that for the SEC as well. Our standard is reasonableness. Okay. Um, one point on vendor due diligence before we move on, because did hear about, um, you know, the impact to the customer and um, I don't have any statistics, but I would say most of what I've worked on the past two years is, is vendor breaches for organizations, and all those types of vendors need to be in the vendor due diligence risk management process, and they're very different ends of the spectrum, large, large vendors, where companies think, oh, that's a good business opportunity, secure infrastructure, sensitive data, but haven't properly classified it, aren't sure what they've put up in the cloud, and aren't sure the roles and responsibilities. Sometimes that data is just like the data on-prem. It needs They need to be scanning it, but, but it's all up in, you know, with a secure, you know, company that ha offers a secure infrastructure. So that's one type of vendor we see. Um, you know, needing to be, uh, have more attention on, and then the other type is very, very small vendors where you provide, you know, large volumes of very sensitive data. You have good contracts in place, but it, there's not as much trust but verify. You really haven't validated they're doing what they say, or maybe they haven't said they're doing much, and you've done a risk assessment, but you haven't followed up on all the items to get their standards up to, to where it is. So. One area that gets a lot of regulator attention, lots of breaches with lots of customer impact in that, in that area. Let me ask the conference organizers, since we are still at 45 minutes here on the, on the screen, um, if they could let me know how much time we have left. We, we haven't, oh, oh, here it goes, here it goes. We are down to three minutes, okay. <laughs> that was fast. Two, two minutes and 59, all the way from 45. Great. Um, oops. That again. I know um, one thing that the session description talked about, and we don't have much time, but I would like to solicit EJ and Ryan's thoughts on effective training strategies. Maybe the three things that you've seen companies can improve on, either training the whole workforce, um, specialized training on phishing, role-based training. What could organizations, RIAs and broker-dealers do better? I think it's important to uh, tailor the training to your firm. Uh, there's certainly, you know, free training uh, that's, that's out there that's accessible. Uh, anybody can just you know pull up YouTube and you know search for cybersecurity training and find general knowledge, general cybersecurity awareness, uh, you know, topical training. Uh, but I think it really only resonates when it's it's short, it's concise, it's tailored to your firm and your firm's policies and procedures. Um, it doesn't make sense to ask all of your staff to watch a training, um, you know, about encryption if your firm doesn't mandate encryption. It just those two need to line up. I think that's uh, consistent with the point that Alexis mentioned that um, your cybersecurity program needs to be tailored to your firm. Uh, you know, your policies and procedures matter just as much as you know what you're doing to test and validate those. Um, I guess the, the one other point that I'll make on on training is um, keep doing it. Uh, training is not a, a set it and forget it. It's not something to do once, and if everybody passes, you're done. Uh, risks evolve, and there's employee turnover. So your staff may have gotten a perfect score today. A year from now, um, you know, three people may have left, five people may have joined. Those five people that may have joined um, you know, may be uh, new to the investment advisory industry, new to uh, understanding cybersecurity risks, and maybe those five are the, are the ones that fall for the phishing test or that don't fully appreciate uh, the importance of you know, encryption or not storing everything uh, in a cloud provider of, of their choice that's not a firm approved one. Yeah, yeah and just to echo, everything you just said is, is spot on. Um, I think to echo it and add to it, uh, positive training. And mm -hmm. I, I mean that in all sorts of the words, right? Uh, the training should be fun, should be memorable, should be an enjoyable experience. As hard as it is to find, it's worth finding. If you could find training that your employees at least tolerate, they're much more likely to 
receive and retain the training. And most importantly, I've seen many, so many organizations do phishing testing, and they focus on the people who collect the link. I mean, I've done tests for companies and hit 35, 36%, and it's great. But I always go back to the, the contracting party, and I go, but how many people called IT? How many people forwarded the email? Mm -hmm. You can't get to a zero, you cannot continually get to a 0% click rate. It's impossible, in fact. But it is achievable to get to close to 100% reporting rate, and that can be the real difference in a, a breach. If everybody's getting an email and IT sees this, they can start trying to figure things out fast. If somebody clicks an email and they're afraid of being penalized or they, they fell for a test, and they're going to just quietly pretend it didn't happen, um, bad things happen. And last point on training, current. It should be oh, yeah. current, real time versus the threats out there. W-2 scams, immediately get out. Hey, we're seeing these scams. Make sure your employees are aware of them. I'm sure we're going to start to see those for coronavirus as well. Thank you very much for your attention today and for the esteemed panelists. I'm very appreciative of your time and your comments. Thank you. Thank you.